Welcome everyone to the NCAR EOL seminar. Today's speaker is Dr. Johan Jensen from the research aviation facility at NCAR EOL. Dr. Jensen got his master's degree at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He then moved to the United States to Seattle where he got his PhD at the University of Washington. Um, Jan stayed at the University of Washington a couple more years uh, for a postdoc before he became a postdoc at NCAR at the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Lab. Um, he then moved on uh, to Australia where he became a scientist at the CSIRO Atmospheric Research in Melbourne. He stayed in Australia for about a decade before he came back to NCAR to the research aviation facility where he has been a scientist ever since. Um, he was the or is the leader of the RAF's uh, scientific project management group and also the leader of the science and instrumentation group. Um, Dr. Jensen is an expert in cloud microphysics and cloud physics and he has worked on many cloud models on cloud droplet growth models, aerosol models, cloud parcel models, turbulent eddy models, many others. But he is also, or mostly, an observationalist. And so he has actually participated in, I think, about 30 field campaigns. Um, he has also won uh, numerous awards, I think over 20. And I think I counted over 60 uh, published journal articles. Um, as the leader of the scientific instrumentation group at REF, he also uh, developed many different um, instruments. He worked on software development for scientific instrumentation, on instrument calibration, but yeah, he mostly also developed instruments or oversaw the development of uh, scientific instruments. And yeah, I think we will hear uh, some uh, something about that today and so I'm very much looking forward to Dr. Jensen's presentation and welcome. Okay Ulrike thank you very much and thank you to all of you who are listening wherever you may be at whatever time it is. Um, so um, I have a bit of a tongue-in-cheek title here COVID meets cloud physics and so on on the hygroscopic properties of saliva and phlegm and implications for virus viability. And um, uh, let me just say, um, there's, um, I have a certain humility here. I'm not an atmospheric scientist. I am an atmospheric scientist, not a biologist and not a medically qualified person. And therefore, please don't take the, uh, the things that I say here as medical advice and so on. I'm also virtually new to the study of human drops, but I worked for a while with other ones and so on. And I have obviously, given the shortness that I have uh, looked into this, uh, there are lots of papers I haven't written, so I haven't read. So um, apologies for if I'm not um, uh, referring the right one. And to some of you, if you can hear howling in the background, we have a howling thunderstorm right outside my window, and I hope that uh, it doesn't interfere with uh, what I'm saying here. So. Okay, lots of people have helped me here along the way. Jeff Stith, uh, Carl Swens, Stuart Beaton, Teresa Campus, Mike Reeves, Matt Heyman, Charlie Knight, and early on uh, Lydia Morawska uh, from Queensland Institute of Technology and lots of other people. So really the background for this talk is um, uh, that I started to look at the hygroscopic properties and as part of it, I saw this particular um, call it a flyer or a website where um, people who are very skilled in um, human health and so on were um, asking WHO to go for a relative humidity of 40 to 60% in buildings and so on. And um, there are very good arguments for that. Some of which are that uh, if you look at it at the bottom part here that the immune system works well at those relative humidities that uh, viruses retain moisture and uh, therefore they are heavier at least by a bit and they have a, a larger sedimentation velocity and also that 
um, airborne drops, uh, when they are moist, uh, have physiochemical processes that may deactivate uh, the viruses. Um, so I, I looked at the 40% and some of the uh, background that I had been studying and so on, and I wasn't quite so sure that the lower limit is necessarily uh, the best limit that one can come up with. Um, and it may be right based on clinical studies of people and thickness and so on, but based on certain aerosol properties, I'm less certain that you can have a fixed value and that it is the correct value there. And that really has to do with the fact that uh, human exhaled drops are complex salt mixtures and also with proteins and other things. And that some of the studies that people have been doing really uh, probably have a fair amount of measurement uncertainty. So, um, with the um, uh, outline here, I think I would rather than going through line by line, get stuck straight into it and say, this is kind of my background. We normally deal with observations. I like to look at uh, sea salt particles. Uh, we use research aircraft to do that. Um, on occasion, we are flying over the Southern Ocean in howling winds uh, and so on. And um, the reason that I'm particularly interested in it is that uh, these giant salt particles, bigger than about a diameter in, uh, a micron in diameter, uh, have maybe a million times larger mass than the uh, smaller CCN. And we know that condensation works and that they grow very large. So the question is, are there enough of these large ones that you can actually uh, explain warm rain on that basis? But there are also many other people who study uh, sea spray drops because they form, they, uh, most of them are small, they form cloud droplets and in a climate sense they help uh, reflect sunlight from the Earth's uh, surface. So we have built an instrument and uh, right now it's an automatic, um, we call it a giant nuclear impactor. It's a sort of a robotics box that sit up under the aircraft floor that has a strut going out here. And basically it can take a little polycarbonate uh, microscope slides and stick them out of the aircraft uh, on command. And it's all controlled from a satellite. So I can actually sit at Jeffco or at Starbucks or in a hotel room looking at the data that comes down from the aircraft and say, all right, now we are under the study cloud and I want to sample aerosol particles here. After we have uh, sampled them, we take them back, we put them in desiccated test tubes, we take them back and put them in the laboratory, put them into uh, uh, cassette holders like you can see here on the right hand side, you can see that we put um, the cassettes uh, into little glass chambers and at the very top part here, you can see that there are connections so that we can feed humidified air in uh, uh, through both ends and uh, so that we can have circulating relative humidity air um, at whatever value that we want. Uh, all of this uh, is uh, done with a optical microscope. Uh, you can see there's a vertical column here that can look down on the surface of the slides. But we also have a horizontal column here that can look in uh, on the particles and see if they are high, if they are flat and, and these sorts of things. And I'm going to show you images of both of them. And typically we provide humidified air at about 90% rel relative humidity by bubbling air through a U-tube with uh, a large amount of potassium nitrate in solution so much that the crystals don't dissolve. And as we bubble the air through, uh, they come into an equilibrium uh, relative humidity of about 90% at 33 and a half degrees Celsius. We, um, we put 40 of these slides in at a time. Um, we uh, temper stabilize the microscope system uh, literally for maybe four months and so on. Uh, and then we start taking images of the particles on the slides and we take 350 images on each slide. That was a very close by thunder. Um, here you have an example. Uh, here you have the um, microscope inside the uh, temperature uh, insulated box with computers and controllers and lamps and so on outside. And this is an example of what we see. So um, on the left hand side, uh, you can see uh, some particles at 90%, and they are sea salt particles mainly, the dark ones. Uh, they are 
not quite hemispheric, but um, uh, drops. They are, as you can see from the side on the right hand side, that they are really uh, spherical cap drops. And there's about 37 micron from black line to black line in the image here. So um, uh, if we were to um, use the Kurla equation and say that at 90% uh, relative humidity, I would say that the largest particle here probably has a uh, dry diameter of about 10 micron or so. But you can also see that there's a, another particle here that looks a lot lighter. And it looks lighter because it's much flatter. And what makes a particle um, flat when uh, all the other ones stand up very nice and proud here? Uh, and it really has to do with uh, having an organic surface coating uh, on them. So a surfactant, the surfactant reduces the um, um, their relative humidity and uh, that makes uh, the drop much uh, shallower and so on. So here's an example of uh, another one uh, that I only took here a couple of days ago. You can see a nice sea salt particle, actually many of them, the dark particles, and then this other particle that has a lot more organic uh, in it. And you can also see there are little bits and pieces in it. Maybe it's pieces of plankton or other material uh, inside, but it looks quite different from these. Even the large ones may have uh, little pieces of plankton in. They are not completely sea salt. Uh, there are also uh, other material in it and so on. And what I'm going to do right now is to um, uh, let dry air into this so that we can see what happens to these particles as they evaporate. And um, after 143 seconds, you can see the big particle here has crystallized. The other one, the organic one here, looks quite interesting actually. You can see that there are crystals inside, but there's still an organic, organic mass here uh, on the outside of it, as if the crystal has separated from the uh, organic material. And gradually, with a bit extra time, uh, then we end up with that uh, all the other particles around here no longer uh, look round, that they have also uh, crystallized out. So. What is the relationship of this really to um, human exhaled drops? So first of all, um, what is the composition of uh, drops that may come from your lungs, from saliva, from the nasal fluid and so on? And I've actually had a little bit of a hard time uh, finding really good numbers of it. Uh, EFRAS here did measurements on both saliva and you can see the composition here. Um, and I should say that the uh, total mass that uh, he found was about 22 grams per liter of which the protein was 20 grams. So the salt here uh, is down at about only 0.2% uh, in his measurements. And if you look at the respiratory fluid down here, the composition numbers are somewhat uh, different, uh, but um, uh, the, um, again, there's a, a considerable amount of protein uh, in these particles here. And that actually contrasts with measurements that have been done by Enberg in 2002, who basically found that roughly there was equally uh, equal amounts of proteins and um, um, salt ions in, the, um, in saliva and so on. So there's, there's a bit of a difference there. And I want to say up front here, if anybody has better data than this, in particular on the salt, please let me know and send an email to me and it would be much appreciated. So, Okay, so a little bit about viruses before we talk about viability and so on. So we have obviously all seen the COVID virus here. Um, you can see that there are various, uh, there's a gray lipid coating on the outside of the virus. There are various proteins that stick out so that it can latch on to uh, host uh, tissue and so on. And um, inside the, uh, inside the uh, coating here is then the RNA of the virus and that is surrounded by what's called uh, the protein capsid coat and that's all inside here. Uh, if you take images of it, as was done by Fias uh, very recently here, they tried to look at a particle very soon after they had been turned into aerosol particles and captured and also after 16 hours and their comment was that uh, this virus actually looked like uh, it was uh, very well um, uh, 
uh, alive uh, in this case here. So I'm being told that you can't see my mouse uh, moving around. Um, so um, I will try to make more of a um, uh, an attempt at uh, just explaining what we are uh, and, and what to look at on the figures and so on. So recent studies have shown that uh, half light time of the COVID is maybe of the order of one to two hours and so on. They can be observed for many hours uh, afterwards uh, when it is uh, in aerosol particles. Um, and then I wanna go back to a, um, what is probably a classical virus viability study uh, by Harper in 61. And uh, it's sort of for the uh, atmospheric um, part of the uh, people who are here, for, uh, that what people often do is they take a broth in which they, which is a dilute salt solution and protein, and uh, you have uh, a number of viruses in this broth. Then you use a nebulizer, you create small drops, you may size sort them, put the drops uh, into what's called a plaque assay or some other growth medium, and then you count the number of infected regions, which gives you an initial uh, viable virus concentration. And then you take some of the other small drops, uh, some of which obviously have the virus as well, into a rotating drum where you have a fixed temperature and relative humidity. And after an hour of rotating it slowly, you can extract some air with drops or aerosol particles. And now you take those particles and you put it on the same kind of plaque assay and you count the number of infected regions in the assay. And that gives you the viable concentration after about an hour. So by taking the ratio of the viable concentration after an hour divided by the initial viable concentration, you come up with a number which is the relative viability. So typically it start out as one and as more and more of the viruses are deactivated, the number gets smaller and smaller. And I should say that this is sort of my quick understanding and uh, bio microbiologists can probably tell me that it's much more complicated than that. Okay, so Harper took four viruses in four different broths. And that means four different broths means different proteins and also different salts in it. And he tried to look at the relative viability and at first, when you look at it, you would say, well, there's not really a correlation here. There's a correlation for influenza, poliomyelitis, there's an inverse one. There's not a whole lot uh, down here for an encephalomyelitis. But um, really, what I think the first thing to look at is that this is actually very, very sparse data. And um, by that, I mean that the relative humidity from sample to sample uh, typically uh, increments by something like 15 to 25%. And that may mean that there's actually hidden physics that is not calculated uh, between the points and so on. And that will be a, um, a big part of uh, what is coming up in the rest of the talk here. So there's a wonderful discussion in Harper here uh, where he's talking about uh, the first, the top yellow thing here, there was a sudden increase in the viable decay of influenza. Uh, above 35% for one of them. And uh, further down that um, the method of preparing suspensions may in fact have a lot to do with the viability and so on. Unpublished work has shown that the influence of relative, hu relative humidity on viable decay of some of the airborne bacteria can be very much modified by the use of different growth media in preparing suspensions. So that may sort of uh, be an indicator for uh, not the absolute magnitude of the um, decay that was shown in the uh, last figure, but uh, the differences in, in all the slopes that appeared to come out of it. Okay, so um, let's look at um, two different ways that this have, um, and probably more, that has uh, arisen here from uh, Harper's study. So Shaman and Cohn basically said, well, we can see a good correlation with temperature in the top right figure, and also a, a good correlation of um, uh, virus viability with the um, uh, vapor pressure, um, which is a, a means of the absolute uh, humidity in the air. And what they uh, used that for was basically to come up with the foundations for one of their, one of the, and I'm calling it simple models here, even if they have developed to be very, very complicated, 
but of the models that you use to uh, predict um, the development of uh, pandemics and uh, influencers uh, and so on. And the green data points in the lower left is uh, the data and the other curves are essentially how well they could match up the, um, um, uh, their prediction uh, with the actual data here using the model that is based on temperature and uh, absolute humidity. But there's also another way uh, that was done and maybe that's more symptomatic for the way that Lindsay Ma and her group uh, has done. Um, the figure here is from Lin and Ma in 2020, where on the left, uh, on the y-axis is the relative uh, viability. Uh, in the top figure, you can see that the, um, and let me, let me just see if I can get my mouse to work here again, just one moment. All right. Can you see the mouse work now? Okay, so I will, I will continue again. But if you look at the um, um, top um, right hand side here, you see there's a drop in the viability um, at about 55% uh, relative humidity and so on. It's, it's kind of a broad drop down for the red curve. Um, this is for very small aerosolized particles. And at the bottom, it is for large drops about 1.3 millimeter in diameter. And the red data points show the same minimum at about 55% relative humidity, but that uh, you can also see that there is uh, actually a larger, uh, reduction in the viability in the bottom one here. So this is really based on relative humidity, whereas the other, uh, the previous uh, page showed the absolute humidity and so on. So two very different ways of looking at it. All right, so next, what happens when a human drop, uh, exhale drop is evaporating? And there's been many model studies of uh, drops of different sizes coming out of people. Uh, on the top right, you can see large drops of 100 micron coming up and uh, essentially falling down very quickly. Medium-sized particles can be airborne for longer and small particles uh, tend to kind of stay up there uh, because they evaporate to even smaller sizes and then they have negligible sedimentation velocity and so on. So um, you can also see on the left side here, if you put in a bit of turbulence and so on, that um, you still end up with quite a size sorting uh, between the different uh, particle sizes. Uh, measurement uh, done by uh, Lydia Marauska's group in uh, Australia also looked at um, size distributions from uh, people who are exhaling drops. And uh, a subset is shown here for um, what they called a voluntary coughing. You can see that there are two modes of um, particle sizes, one that might be out at something like 100, 150 micron uh, mode, and then a much smaller one, which is down at one. And at coughing, you can make the large particle. If you're only speaking, you're making fewer particles, smaller particles, and so on. Uh, but these are the number distributions. And if you really were looking at the volume distribution, and you might think that the total number of virus that come out is more related to volume distribution than it is to number distribution, there might be more of the, part of the virus particles in the very large part here. Uh, but um, there are also good arguments for why the small mode is actually very, very important. Uh, Morawska and Kaus argument here uh, is basically that um, uh, there's a sufficient number of small particles that are being generated. They can stay in the air and they are much more efficient at getting uh, far down in a receiving person's uh, respiratory tract. And once they get down there, um, they have a high degree of infection, whereas the very large drops may have ended up on the floor uh, before they actually could do any damage. So there's obviously uh, two ways of looking at this. Um, and both of them are uh, probably quite important. So I also did just a, a little calculation where I basically tried to say, uh, spit out some drops of 10, 20 and 30 micron and see how far they fall down as a function of time. You can see the smallest ones uh, within a second or two, they no longer change size. Uh, 
uh, the largest drops at 50 micron radius uh, are down on the ground in about six seconds and then they uh, really can't spread uh, unless they're resuspended uh, from uh, that point there. So, so what else is weird about um, respiratory fluids? So what is in sputum? So there might be something like half a percent uh, or one percent of dry matter, maybe two percent of it. Um, the measurements aren't all that uh, good but no, or they're not all that consistent from what I've seen. But if people end up with fairly dry um, sputum, so here you have um, a limit at about four or um, close to five, normal sputum is fairly liquid. If you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in the center here, then you are, um, it starts to get much more thick. And once you're over in uh, cystic fibrosis, you have very thick, um, uh, mucus. And uh, there are people who have tried to put little um, uh, polystyrene beads into um, such sputum, or they used artificial sputum, uh, but roughly in the same concentrations of dry matter. And then they took a camera and they looked at Brownian motions as these little balls were basically moving around in the fluid. And as they took um, uh, PSL beads of one micron, and once they were in the fluid, uh, if you have very liquid um, sputum, one and a half percent dry matter, it moves around a lot. As you uh, start to dry it out, you can see that no longer do the balls move. So there's an indication as a particle is drying out that whatever is stuck inside uh, the sputum is gaining that it has a, a particle size like um, COVID, for instance, of uh, about 0.1 micron, it's going to eventually end up being more or less caught in the sputum and, so, uh, and will be unable to move around. And what um, they also did was to look at, they did power spectra. This is a figure in the right-hand side here. And really they saw that at about four and a half percent, you ended up with this transition from having a viscous solution to basically have a, a gel kind of a, a respiratory fluid. Okay, so let's look at, um, a human exhale drop under a microscope. And you may see that this looks almost like the uh, sea salt drop that you saw out from the ocean. And uh, now I'm asking the question, what actually happens when this drop uh, mixes with dry air and evaporates? So um, obviously as you evaporate water off the drop, it becomes a more uh, concentrated salt solution. Um, but uh, the salt really wants to hold on to the water for quite a while. Uh, salt is very hygroscopic. And for that reason, um, it holds on to it uh, up to a certain point, but eventually uh, the concentration of salt is so high that it basically spontaneously uh, forms uh, crystals. Uh, and you can see here that salt crystallize out and uh, we call that efflorescence. And you'll see the word here, efflorescence, uh, a lot in the remainder of a talk. If you look at the um, figure on the right hand side, uh, you can quite clear see the, uh, the salt crystals, but you can also see the remnant of uh, a uh, protein or other organic material that is still stuck around the particle. So um, um, you have a situation where um, the rest of the water, most of it at least, almost all of it evaporates very quickly after the salts crystallize. And if there now happened to be a virus stuck within uh, this drop before it started to dry up, after it has uh, effloresced, then the, uh, if the virus was out in the organic matter here, then it will uh, in all likelihood stay out in the organic matter. Remember from the last uh, explanation that as the uh, solid matter concentration goes up, particle movement goes down, but it probably doesn't prevent uh, salt ions from going over and uh, be concentrated on the surface of the uh, crystallizing salt particles. So you now end up with uh, salt crystals that are basically inert and uh, surrounded by the organic matter uh, that is not very salty anymore so that your virus actually finds itself in a fairly dry and very favorable environment where it is unlikely to, um, where its viability may actually be very long-term. So. If we want to uh, have the uh, viruses um, being deactivated as much as possible, we should keep 
our human expired drops moist and not let them get into the dry phase, not let them go past the efflorescence point on the right-hand side. Okay, the other thing about this is um, um, I read uh, first papers about this and, and I had the same thought that this is really a really nice physical path for virus viability uh, that um, once you're on the right-hand side, uh, you would expect a slow uh, reduction in viability if it is a salt solution uh, that uh, contributes to the um, uh, deactivation of viruses. But there's also the effect of, of temperature and so on. It's not just uh, a case of having a virus uh, being in the uh, organic uh, non-saline matter. So uh, Yang in 1912 then came up with a two hypotheses here and basically said that um, if on the left side you start out with the green point, basically you have a solution with viruses in it, you now start drying it out um, so that uh, relative humidity decreases down to some value around 50%, the viability gets lower and lower because the salt solution gets more and more concentrated. At 50%, his hypothesis was you would see uh, the efflorescence and below that the viability really didn't depend much on the um, relative humidity. Uh, on the right hand side um, it was a little bit uh, of a different hypothesis because here he considers initial particles that have both salts and proteins in them and you can see that the relationship in the uh, 99 to 50 percent relative humidity uh, there's still the, the maximum uh, deactivation, but it's not as strong as if you have uh, just the concentrated solutions. And once you are in the dry part of it, uh, in the efflorescent part of it, um, below 50%, then you, um, you, uh, there's not a, a relative humidity uh, dependence on uh, the, uh, the uh, virus viability. Okay, so let's talk about um, some hygroscopic properties of sodium chloride. And um, people have tried to put um, uh, sodium chloride droplets up um, in, um, by all sorts of means, essentially Millikan's experiment here where you have an electrodynamic balance. You have two plates essentially with a, um, an electric field between them and you uh, charge a drop and you put it into the center of it and then you take this whole thing and you put it into the chamber where you can change the relative humidity. And um, the first uh, really good study of that that I'm aware of was Tang's et al. from 1997. So if you look at the upper right hand corner of it, you start with a highly dilute uh, salt uh, droplet. It is uh, at a uh, maybe a 93% relative humidity. On the left axis, you can see that it has a mass that is many times larger than what its dry uh, mass eventually would be if you dried it out completely, which is down at one here. So um, you start with a um, dilute sodium chloride drop up there. Now you change the relative humidity slowly or fast but you see what it's, uh, the relative humidity will give an equilibrium size of this drop that is essentially following the red drops down here or the red circles uh, going down the curve. Um, but when you get down to 48%, and now we are following the dashed line here, uh, essentially that's where you have the efflorescence. Suddenly all the water vapor evaporates out of the drops, the, uh, the drop is no longer a solution drop, but you have crystallized particles and you get all the way down to um, having an essentially uh, waterless state for the uh, salt particle. And if you um, put it in even drier air, it doesn't make much difference to the uh, uh, mass of this particle and so on. So if you now turn it around and you say, all right, let's start increasing the relative humidity. For sea salt, you follow the dashed line all the way out to about 77% relative humidity before suddenly uh, your salt crystals turn into drops again. And this is the deliquescence point uh, of, the, uh, of sodium chloride. So you can see that there's a really big difference between um, in a reducing, in, in, a, in a drying out environment for such a uh, salt solution, 
where you have to take it far down before it becomes crystallized and in an increasing relative humidity where you have to get to a very, very large relative humidity before um, the uh, particle turns into a solution drop again. So this was a really nice uh, study that was being made. Um, and I've only talked about the uh, pure sodium chloride here, uh, but obviously uh, a lot of salts are um, mixtures of several components and also human exhaled drops have uh, potassium, sodium, uh, chloride, uh, phosphate uh, probably um, uh, and so on in it. So they're much more complicated mixtures. But in uh, atmospheric science, um, you can look at the composition of seawater and that is very well determined. The top part of the curve here show the percentage fraction of uh, mass fraction of the different ions. And if you go down to the last three below the, um, um, in the lower left part of it here, you could really say that if you took the upper composition and tried to mix it into actual salts, that uh, sodium chloride is the most dominant one, magnesium chloride is the next one. So Gupta et al took these um, and just said, I'm going to look at those two salts together to see what is the hygroscopic properties of those two salts. And um, the first thing that he did was in the upper left, basically say, I want to see uh, what is the response if I try to do the same experiment as what um, Tang et al had done. And um, you follow the black circles in the upper left figure down and you can see his measurement said you have to get down to about 46.6% before you reach deliquescence and then suddenly you get all the way down to um, that there was no in, uh, the uh, completely dry uh, particle uh, size. Uh, again, if you now were to increase the relative humidity, he found you had to get out to 74, 75% before deliquescence happen. But for a different salt, and now look at the upper right corner, uh, so magnesium chloride, which is also a part of seawater, um, you can see that for it, its deliquescence point is all the way down at about 5% uh, relative humidity. So it's quite obvious that different salts have very different deliquescence and effervescence uh, points. And um, that must matter when uh, you, um, when you are looking at uh, human drops, as I mentioned before. So the next experiment that Gupta did was uh, to say, all right, now I start with 90% sodium chloride and 10% magnesium chloride. And I start with a nice solution drop and you can see the upper blue drop in the upper right corner. Um, uh, he is uh, imaging it from below and viewing from above or vice versa. And um, initially the, you can see that I guess his light source is completely circular so that uh, there's no crystals inside the drop as at 85% relative humidity. Then follow the black curves down as he reduced the relative humidity uh, all the way down to 45.9% where he started to see uh, efflorescence. And you can, if you look at the, um, the blue circle at around 45.6%, the one that says first efflorescence relative humidity, you can see that there's a, a faint image of crystals inside the drop and maybe the shape on the outside is not quite as round as what it used to be before. Then he reduced the uh, relative humidity even more down to about 5% and suddenly he saw the efflorescence of the magnesium chloride and there you can see both the inside and the outside are complete uh, crystal surfaces and so on. So when you have mixtures of salts, uh, you have multiple efflorescence point. If you were to think of a human exhaled drop, you really need to know what the uh, salt composition of that is in order to find out if there are places where uh, virus viability changes dramatically as you go from the liquid drop side of the efflorescence point to the uh, left dry side of the uh, efflorescence point. Okay, so um, now let's get a little bit closer to human exhaled drops. And in another study, and this was done with what's called tandem mobility, uh, mobile mobility analysis, sorry, um, uh, Mikhailov and a group of other people in 2004 
looked at mixtures of sodium chloride and protein particles. But at first, they also wanted to do the same study as what Tang had done. And um, you can see, follow the red points down, the deliquescence point they found to be, sorry, the efflorescence point was at about 41% for sodium chloride, so somewhat lower than what Tang et al. had seen. And then when they tried to go up to the, uh, following the blue uh, circles out to the right, and you try to deliquesce the particle again, they were out at about maybe 76, where Tang uh, et al. was a little bit higher than that. So um, next, what, um, what they did was they basically said they had seen the same composition papers with of um, the relative fraction of protein in human exhaled drops to salts in human exhaled drops that I showed you before. You remember I said um, the one study said there's 10% salt in the dry matter and 90% um, Protein, uh, another study said there's essentially 50-50% of those two things in it. So um, Mikhailov uh, tried to go through the whole spectrum from 90 to 10 with sodium chloride dominating to uh, essentially 75 to 25% with uh, protein uh, dominating. So um, if you look at the top left one first, you can see that the efflorescence point is at about 40% there, whereas for pure salt, it was out at 41. If you go to the upper right figure, you can see with more protein into it, the efflorescence point is now down at maybe 38%. If you go to figure C in the lower left with uh, even more protein in it, uh, the efflorescence point is down at maybe 37%. And eventually in the lower right with the most protein fraction, you end up with the uh, relative, the efflorescence point being somewhere around 36%. And uh, if you remember what the results was for Tang et al, um, he had measurements that were all the way for sodium chloride up at about 48%. So it makes a big difference uh, to have protein in human exhaled drops for how long for how low you can go with relative humidity before they uh, efflorescence out and form salt crystals. So I took the three studies and I plotted them up here. And what you can see in the, uh, on the x-axis here is the fraction of protein uh, to sodium chloride. So the, um, at the x value of zero, that means pure sodium chloride. We have three different measurements there. We have tanks measurement at 48%. We have Gupta's with um, uh, two uh, at uh, 46% and Mikhailov's at 41%. And in addition, I've shown the other values from Mikhailov's study that said, as you increase the protein fraction, the efflorescence relative humidity gets lower. But on the x-axis there, you can see that of the studies that have been looking at pure sodium chloride, there's actually a 7% difference in where they say sodium chloride should efflorescence. And if you look over at the right-hand side and you say, well, if you just look at from pure drops, because we are not quite sure what the, uh, if the salts dominate in human drops or if the proteins dominate, and out to the 75% uh, where the protein dominates, we actually have a 12% range in efflorescence relative humidity uh, by um, uh, taking all the measurements into it. And I have to say, I mean, is sodium chloride really the right value to use for human, um, um, uh, human drops? And, and right now, because I don't know the, the salt composition of human drops well enough, it's a little bit difficult for me to say, but I'm going to make the assumption that sodium chloride is a major component and that that has a um, main um, impact on the uh, virus viability. But you can see another thing. If you think back to my first motivation um, where um, the argument was being made that really 40% to 60% is the uh, optimum relative humidity, at least when you consider particles with sodium chloride in it, the 40% falls almost smack dab in, uh, in the middle of the uh, the limit uh, where you would expect their, uh, the composition to be um, 
it could be either uh, saline drops, which is um, uh, up above the, uh, the horizontal black line or dry particles uh, down below. So um, I'm not so sure that um, uh, having 40% may in fact be too low a number to recommend for what the relative humidity should be in uh, hospitals, public buildings, uh, and so on. Okay, so let me just um, try to wrap up uh, here and say that there have been clearly um, Studies that have hypothesized that concentrated salt solution is a hostile environment for virus viability. And that basically says keep your human exhale drops from drying out. And it's not so clear if, and I have seen other references to this, if it's the fact that the salt is toxic to the virus or if the salt is so hygroscopic that the water leaves the virus and the viruses uh, basically desiccate or if there's another uh, mechanism of it. Now, um, what I would like to do is basically to use our microscope uh, to look at the hygroscopic properties of actual human drops, because all the other uh, studies you've seen here have been looking at sodium chloride, sodium magnesium chloride, and sodium chloride with um, uh, protein in it, but there's no substitute for looking at actual human uh, modified uh, human exhaled drops. And you saw that the microscope can quite clearly see uh, the point where um, efflorescence happened. Uh, you saw the organic sea salt particles that had uh, uh, crystals being formed inside them. Uh, I don't care if I do this or if somebody else does it, maybe somebody else can do it as well, but it's something that I think should definitely be done. Um, I would also say that um, keep the re relative humidity from going below the efflorescence relative humidity. And if you are a manager at a, a public building uh, and you can control the relative humidity, set it a bit higher than necessary because once you go below the efflorescence relative humidity, then the aerosols go dry and they have a much longer uh, period of, ha of uh, having no reduction in viability or low reduction in viability. Uh, there are other things that if you really are dealing with buildings that um, you may be able to uh, control temperature and humidity very well in a hospital, uh, in nursing homes. Uh, I don't think so. Um, my dad is in a nursing home. I know they open the doors and windows whenever they want to uh, and so on. Um, but even if uh, everything was controlled by relative humidity, there may still be outside factors like the sun is burning on one side of the building and heating it up in there. If you don't have a very uh, rapid change of the air inside the building, you may still end up that the air warms up and the relative humidity goes down and so on. So um, I think uh, it would be better not to set the relative humidity uh, too low. Uh, but rather aim in the uh, in the direction of having it higher than the minimum. Um, I would also like to see, and I, this is as a novice from the outside, that more virus viability studies uh, worked on getting away from the sparse resolution in relative humidity to a much higher resolution around the different uh, efflorescence point. And maybe it's just a case that I haven't seen enough of them, but of the many studies I've seen, uh, there's only one that has really been down at the 5% uh, increments and so on. I think even better would, um, uh, even smaller jumps would be better than that. And really having 10 to 15% increment uh, to me does not seem sufficient when you're trying to determine an optimum uh, relative humidity range of uh, 40 to 60%. Okay, so let me just go through the arguments here uh, again. And it's kind of my summary slide. So virus viabilities often have sparse data with large jumps in relative humidity. Um, the uh, 40 to 60% uh, recommended optimum range for indoor relative humidity air is also kind of a coarse grain, coarse resolution, uh, in, in particular in view of what's happening up in uh, point one. And there's a very considerable uh, variability in measured efflorescence relative humidity for um, aerosol particles of pure sodium chloride, 7%. Some of that I would say is measurement differences uh, and so on. And it would be very good to get that uh, better pinned down. Uh, 
Um, there's considerable variability in published chemical composition of human exhaled drops, so saliva, lung fluid, phlegm, and so on. And uh, with some of them showing about a factor 10 difference in the ratio of protein to salt, um, that adds extra to un the uncertainty of uh, what is the good minimum uh, relative humidity to recommend for buildings. And um, uh, when you start adding protein, the efflorescence point goes about 6% below that of pure sodium chloride. And so I would say that um, the relative, the likely efflorescence relative humidity uh, for human expired drops to the extent that uh, sodium chloride uh, is present and sodium chloride in uh, significant mixtures in case of any other surprises in the physics is probably as wide as 45 to 48 percent. So would a 50 to 60 percent optimum range be better? Um, I would think so, but clearly this is something that uh, one would need more work uh, to be done on. I would also say that most, it's probably most important that you stick to the optimum humidity range if you're dealing with buildings uh, with a lot of sick people, so hospitals and nursing homes and so on, uh, for the reason that um, you don't have the same large numbers of um, uh, spreaders of uh, viral diseases in normal offices, but obviously being able to get 50 to 60% in uh, an, a normal office is also a desirable thing to get towards. And, especially when there are pandemics or other um, uh, big influenza uh, periods and so on. And I have a list of references here. It's not complete of uh, for what I presented here. If somebody sends me an email, uh, I can send you an updated reference list tomorrow. Um, this was my um, main uh, list of conclusions here. And then uh, back to the caveats here that nothing in this talk should be taken as medical advice. I would also say, uh, you know, there's a pandemic out there and you can use this material freely. If you can do these analysis better than what I can do, go right ahead, do it as quickly as possible. If you can teach me about things, uh, send me emails and obviously I have much to learn. And you can also draw me into uh, to the extent uh, that I have time for it and you have my uh, email address down here in the bottom. And with that, I would like to say um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan. So, um, yeah, as you may have seen in the flyer that was sent out, or if you got the calendar invite, the only way to ask questions here during the seminar is to send me an email. So you should have my email address either in the flyer or the calendar invite. So please uh, send questions to me now. I'm still waiting for the first ones. And while I am waiting for questions to come in, I was, um, so you focused your presentation on the lower limit of this 40 to 60%, and you're arguing that it maybe should be 50 to 60%. I'm wondering, if you um, came across anything about the upper limit, the 60%, does that have anything to do with the virus or is that just the general upper limit that has more to do with things like mold, for example? Uh, yes, so um, um, you, obviously that's a good point because um, if you have very high humidities, uh, bacteria may tend to grow better. Bacteria apparently don't like very dry air. Um, so um, the 40 to 60 is also a comfort zone for uh, where people feel that their throats don't dry out and so on, is my understanding. So um, you can really, um, um, the, in de depending on what the current problem is, there may be other relative humidity ranges that are the right ones. Um, for um, if you think of uh, salts and uh, high salinity being a main contributor to deactivation of viruses, then having it up at 60% where the salt solution in general are less dilute is probably, you don't deactivate your uh, viruses as much as you do when you get down to uh, somewhat lower relative uh, 
uh, humidities. But again, it would be very nice to have very high resolution um, uh, virus studies that showed the uh, viability as a function relative of relative humidity. Can you still hear me? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I got several questions in the meantime. Yep. The first one is from uh, Stefan Bormann. He asked, yep. the salty solutions, are they extracting water from the viruses via osmosis? And is that the reason why the viruses are dysfunctional then? Um, so let me go back to... Um, what I understand as the way that um, um, these assays uh, are being done. Um, and really a microbiologist should be uh, answering this question, but my understanding is that you have the broth. I don't actually uh, know if you dilute that or you just put it straight into the nebulizer and start making uh, the particles uh, that way. But um, the, uh, in a sense, it may not matter quite so much, I would think, because um, uh, the moment you have the uh, little droplet out in the air, provided that it is not exceptionally dilute, uh, it's really going to uh, evaporate rather quickly within a second or two towards its uh, equilibrium size. So if you're giving it uh, a small 0.1 or let's say a 0.5 micron um, uh, particle, a broth with a virus inside it, uh, and you put it into 80% relative humidity within a fraction of a second, it, is, it has reached its uh, dry equilibrium size. So, um, um, I'm not. I'm not sure it matters so much necessarily. Maybe it does. Maybe somebody else should answer that question, but I don't think so. Thank you. So the next question is from Chris Walczyk. Yes. Um. You showed a figure of protein salt mixtures where relative humidity was increasing, and it showed that as relative humidity increases to near the delinquency point the droplet mass over size decreases. Why is this? <laughs> That's a good question. I, and I have seriously wondered that also. Um, now the diameters that are being used in that particular study is what's called um, uh, mobility diameters. And people who work with um, 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 mobility uh, particle, uh, mobility analyzers are really uh, much better at uh, answering those questions. So I'm not sure that you can see it as clearly on this one, but uh, if you look at the upper right figure, there might be a hint of it. I have seen the same thing on other parts of the uh, Mikhailov paper where it was actually quite pronounced. So um, it's a very good point. I don't have a good answer for uh, why a protein particle in increasing relative humidity can actually get a smaller uh, mobility diameter. I have to punt that uh, answer to a, a mobility analyzer specialist. And good day, Chris. Okay, so the next question was from Steve Kruger, but he actually asked the exact same question that I asked you in the beginning about the 60% limit. So you had that already, and I will skip ahead to the next question, which is from Jackie Whitty. Um, so she asked, could this explain why humidifiers do not work as efficiently around here, meaning in Colorado? I always wondered why a room small and contained seemed to remain, remain dry despite having a humidifier at full strength. Humidification requires more effort to reach the liquescence. Can you suggest ways we can affect the liquidity of our home other than building an indoor swimming pool? Uh, I'm not sure I have a good answer there, but obviously um, these humidifiers, um, I would have thought that your room has to be pretty small. Your 
uh, ventilation rate has to be very low in order for one of the normal room humidifiers to get the relative humidity up to about 80% uh, relative humidity or so, uh, which is required for the uh, deliquescence. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't have a good answer there, um, but, uh, um, and uh, building the swimming pool sounds very nice, uh, but not so practical. Um, I, I don't have a good answer there. I know that there are some uh, house uh, air conditioners units that actually have humidifiers uh, built into it. Uh, how efficient they work, uh, if you can uh, have enough uh, inner in evaporation that, um, that you can always keep the uh, relative humidity at say 50%. Um, maybe that's possible with a big unit, um, but all of this really comes down to a question of uh, using probably a lot of energy at trying to keep the air humid um, and uh, whilst at the same time wanting to have a rapid exchange of air in rooms so that you, whatever there might be, uh, viruses uh, get uh, uh, blown out through exhausts and so on. So uh, it might be that the future in terms of uh, ventilation and humidification is going to be a lot more energy intensive than what it has been in the past. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Holger Bümmel. And he asked, you showed an early figure from Shaman et al. where they indicated a strong correlation between the viability of virus particles and vapor pressure, but a weaker correlation with temperature. Your point regarding efflorescence and deliquescence, however, is based mostly on relative humidity and the shrinking and growth of particles, which is well taken. How does that match with the strong correlation of the viability with absolute humidity, but poorer correlation with temperatures? <laughs> Good question. And I have been wondering exactly the same. And um, um, this was based on Harper's study and only on the use of the uh, influenza virus. And uh, if uh, instead uh, Shaman uh, it had been using uh, other data, other, other uh, types of viruses and other um, broth with a different salt concentration, uh, maybe no sodium chloride, but other things in it, you would get a, uh, a different result. So I don't actually understand why it works so well, because in his data, you don't really see much of an impact of uh, relative humidity um, on, on the vapor in the bottom here. Uh, and yet it's a very successful model. It has been used to uh, predict routinely, I think they have routine forecast for uh, virus outbreaks in uh, for 80 different locations in the US and maybe outside the US also. Uh, and it has a good track record, but the physics of it is completely different from what I've been arguing about here and also what other people have been arguing. So there are things there that are simply not well understood, I would argue. I, again, I would like to see um, a finer granularity on the virus studies. And maybe this exists today for the influenza virus so that somebody has redone Harper's study with uh, a more up-to-date broth instead of what was being used in this one. And maybe that would give a different result. I just don't know. If somebody knows the answer to that, send me an email and I'll forward it to you, Holger. Okay, so moving on to the next question from Raymond Shaw. Fantastic talk, very insightful. Are there accepted recipes for creating saliva simulants for anyone interested in doing experiments? Um, yes, so I'm, uh, I have seen uh, references and I think it's mainly in the dental literature to people who create uh, synthetic um, um, saliva and I can send uh, I can send you a reference on that uh, Raymond uh, not a problem um, uh, I would still like to see real saliva um, and obviously uh, 
uh, preferably from healthy persons. Um, Van der Grubisitz uh, a couple of weeks ago was mentioning that, yeah, but things are going to be different if you have, uh, well, they might be different in all likelihood when you have uh, deceased persons and so on. But I would say the first thing should be to look at um, the composition of uh, healthy subjects, uh, preferably better with natural uh, saliva than uh, synthetic saliva. Um, but um, I think there would be good value in doing both actually. Okay, so the next question is from Steve Kruger again. So he asks, would higher relative humidity make larger droplets that would fall out more quickly? Yes. Um, and uh, with the caveat slightly that, um, uh, let me go back. Uh, I can't remember where it was. I had, I think I had my little personal calculation here of the spreading of, um, no. You, you remember the figure that I showed, uh, Steve, which was showed um, the um, sedimentation altitude that different particles would have reached uh, the one here. And you can see that if you, um, if you have a uh, lower relative humidity, even the larger uh, particles, say 30 micron particles may not fall as far. Uh, and uh, before they come sufficiently aerosolized that they are kind of hanging around in the atmosphere. So there's a gray zone there where things are going to change, but um, it will make a bit of a difference, I would say, um, but I, I don't know uh, quantitatively how big the difference would actually be. I think the bigger question is just make sure that they remain uh, drops at all times. Okay, the next question is from Sue Ellen Haupt. Um, she asked, a couple of weeks ago, Jeffrey Sherman made a big deal about the difference between relative humidity and absolute humidity. What is your take on this? Were the, ex the experts you showed mostly cr controlled for temperature? Um, well, <laughs> the Harper study controlled for temperature and relative humidity. And what uh, Sharman and Cohn did was they basically recalculated relative humidity and temperature into uh, vapor pressure or absolute humidity. And, um, you know, there clearly virus, uh, this is really a, a microbiologist question. They clearly uh, have different um, uh, reductions in viability when you change temperature. Uh, to me, there's a good physical reason for what's happening when you change uh, relative humidity. And yet, as you can see here, for this particular data set in the lower right corner, when Shaman calculated the uh, vapor pressure uh, and the uh, reduction or the viability rate, then uh, he actually gets a, an, an absolute excellent relationship. But I don't understand the physics of it. I, I don't understand uh, how a virus particle can see absolute humidity. And as cloud physics people, we look at uh, CCN particles and we know they grow with relative humidity or supersaturation once they turn into uh, cloud droplets and so on. So I don't understand the uh, physical argument. Uh, I think it is more that he's basically said that um, we see a good relationship and we're going to use it. And, and that's what he did and got a very uh, successful model out of it. But um, um, uh, I, I can't, I don't know what the physics is. And he gave a very good presentation. I uh, saw that also here a couple of weeks ago, so. Okay, the next question is from Nene Atanasios, who asked, what are your thoughts on phase and the other in aqueous phase? Does that affect its viability? Uh, and I'm sorry, you completely broke up there. Could you repeat? Oh, sorry. Okay, the question is, what are your thoughts about having half the virus in the organic phase and the other in the aqueous phase? Does that affect its viability? Um, so I'm not sure. Uh, that I was saying that, um, so let me go back to 
Uh, where did I do that? No, I'm sorry. I have to let me go down to it, Nines, so I can um, show. I'm sorry here. So this is essentially where the, the argument here that um, initially in the uh, center uh, photograph, the one with the A on, the virus could basically be anywhere there. I don't know if it has an affinity to be inside the drop or on the surface. Um, I, I don't have any feeling about that. But uh, the way I look at it uh, or on the right hand side is that the moment that the crystals are forming, um, you start with one crystal and as the crystal is growing, it's basically pushing the remaining uh, solute and the remaining organic materials out from its sides. And because um, the uh, organic material already has a fairly high, uh, a fairly dry composition, wherever a virus is in that on a macro scale, it's going to be moved out and away from the salt particle. And the, um, if you think of a, a crystal has tiny, tiny distance between say the sodium chloride uh, molecules in the salt crystals, much, much smaller than the size of a virus. So I don't think there's any way that the virus would actually become embedded inside the salt crystal. I think the salt crystals will just be pushed out and away from um, the surface, sorry, the, um, the viruses would be pushed out and away from the salt crystal as the salt is crystallizing and uh, taking up essentially all the available uh, salt from solution. Okay, so that was actually the last question for now. Thank you, question, and I apologize to all of you whose names I pronounced incorrectly. Um, I would also like to mention that this seminar uh, was recorded or is being recorded. And so if you, you can find it on the NCAR um, EOL YouTube channel, um, if you send me an email, I can send you the link. And with that, I would like to uh, thank Jan again. And yeah, thanks for this wonderful presentation. You're welcome. It's a pleasure and you are welcome to email me uh, to the extent I can keep up with it. So thank you very much. And keep your cough drops wet, okay?